on to integration. Year two, integration. Now, the first thing we should probably do is recognize what things that we should be able to integrate at this stage. So let's create a table based on the derivatives. So let's create a table going from the point of view of differentiation. Okay, so what sort of things do we know? So we've got the polynomial type terms. x to the power of n, we know differentiate to n x to the power of n minus 1. And we've already looked at reversing that in integration in year 1. But we also know that e to the power of kx is ke to the kx. And we're actually going to look uh, we're going to look more at, uh, at that when we integrate exponential functions. We also know that sine, I'll just write sine x for now, differentiates to cos x. Cos x differentiates to sine x. And what's also useful is the derivative of um, the natural log which is 1 over x. For now, we'll just work with that list. Of course, we've also differentiated um, cosec and tan and things like that. But for now, we're going to use integration as the reverse of that process. We've also done the product rule to not just the differentiate sine x, but sine 2x. So what that means must mean is that if you integrate this, you must get that. If you integrate this, you must get that. So to start with, let's just treat it on a very basic level. Okay. So with that, we can now put together a skeleton for some basic integrals. So what we can say is as follows. Let's Now, what does that mean? If I've got f of x, and I want to integrate whatever there will be in f of x with respect to x, that means that e to the x, because it differentiates to itself, it must integrate to itself. Okay, so that's not hard to see, that e to the x integrates to itself. Right, the tricky bit is sine and cos, because we're so used to sine differentiating to cos. Okay, if sine differentiates to cos, that means cos must integrate back to sine. Okay, so I'm actually going to write that here, that cos integrates back to sine. Now, cos differentiates the minus sign, but integrates the sign. It's a little bit confusing, but you just need to get, uh, just to get over that, because we're, we're doing a reverse. So it makes sense that it's the opposite. So if you're used to saying, okay, cos differentiates the minus sign, it must be the same. Just reverse, it must be the opposite sign. S-I-G-N, as in the, okay, the, the, the absence of a minus, in this case, in front. Now, sine, integrates to minus cos x. And that's because cos differentiates the minus sign, so minus sign integrates the cos, which means sine must integrate to minus cos. Again, it's just the opposite. Sine differentiates the cos, so we now have to flip the sign because we're doing it in reverse. So that's, that's where we're at. I would like to investigate what happens when we integrate 1 over x. It's not quite so straightforward. It just goes straight to them. Okay? There's, a little, there's a little complication for us to consider. And what happens when we integrate e to the 2x? Okay? Again, intuitively, it might be obvious, but I want to explore that. Okay? So let's look at that now. As we'll find at the beginning of this section, we must use integration as the reverse process of differentiation. So let's start with the differentiation and work our way backwards and see if we can establish a logic. So let's consider the following function. Y is sine 2x 
Now, using the chain rule for differentiation, it's well established by now that the derivative dy by dx, sine of something, differentiates to cos of that something. And of course, we have to multiply by the inside of the function, the derivative of the, what's inside the function. So 2x is inside the function. We have to multiply by that derivative, which is 2. And as we know, sine 2x differentiates to 2 cos 2x. And therefore, it must hold that when you integrate 2 cos 2x, that I end up with sine 2x. Of course, we're integrating, so there must be a plus c here. And now, what we want to be able to do is to do that without having to go through the differentiation in the first place. So, if we think about this, when you're integrating 2 times something, the 2 doesn't get involved in integration. The 2 doesn't get involved in integration. So, for example, if I were to integrate 2x, the integral of 2x, hopefully we know at this stage, is x squared plus c. But to integrate 2x is the same as 2 multiplied by just integrating the x. That 2 doesn't get involved in integration. When you integrate x, what do you get? You get half x squared. Then you multiply by 2. Half x squared times 2 is the same thing. is x squared. Which means that if you have coefficients of terms, they don't get involved in the integration. You can actually take this out. You can write the integral of 2x as 2 times the integral of x. You can factor out the coefficients. So what I'm saying is, the integral of 2 cos 2x actually is the same as 2 multiplied by the integral of cos 2x, which using the reverse of differentiation is okay, sine 2x plus c. And because that's a, a factor, just literally the number 2, I can divide both sides by 2, which means that the integral of cos 2x must be this divided by 2, sine 2x. I've got rid of it here, so I have to divide it on this side, plus c. So cos 2x integrates to sine 2x divided by 2. Right, now let's try and uh, summarise that without having to go through differentiation and then playing around with it. We're just investigating for the first time. Okay, so just to summarise, we've differentiated sine 2x to 2 cos 2x, which then followed that the integral of 2 cos 2x must be sine 2x, and then we just... In, in, we, just, in, we just established, if you didn't realise already, that, that that doesn't get involved in integration. I can take that out as a factor, and then I can divide through to get the result that cos 2 integrates to sine 2x plus 2. That's uh, sine 2x over 2 plus c. Now, in the previous board, we, we already established that cos integrates to sine, because sine differentiates the cos. So where, where can, how, how, how can that division by 2, like, how can I recognise that without going through all of this long process? So in fact, we call this the reverse chain rule. The reverse chain rule. Why? Because in the, in, the, in, the, in the regular chain rule for differentiation, where does that 2 come from? It comes from differentiating the 2x. Because the inside of my function is not just x, I have to differentiate sine like normal and then multiply by this derivative. 2x differentiates to 2. So here, because it's integration and it's in the reverse, I must do the reverse. Cos of something integrates to sine of something. But then instead of multiplying by the derivative of 2x, you then divide. So it works exactly the same, and I call this the reverse chain rule. So let's just do a few examples to make that clear. Reverse chain rule. So it works the same way, just in reverse, as the name suggests. So I'm integrating sine of something. Now, again, let's not get confused. Sine now differentiates the cos. We know that already but it integrates to minus cos, because cos differentiates to minus sine. So flip the minus on each side. So the integral of sine is minus cos. So sine of something 
integrates to minus cos of whatever's inside that function. Now, with differentiation, we then multiply by the inner derivative. Okay? The derivative of this, which is 3, I would usually multiply it by 3. It's different integration now. We're doing integration. So instead of multiplying by that derivative, we divide by 3. And of course, add plus. Ideally, this should be on the same line. I'll run out of space. So minus a third, cos 3x minus uh, 2, all divided by 3, plus c. This one here, e to the something. Remember, differentiates and integrates to itself. So e to the 1 minus 2x is e to the 1 minus 2x. If it was differentiation, I would multiply by this derivative. 1 doesn't differentiate to anything. Minus 2x differentiates to minus 2. I would usually multiply by minus 2, but it's integration. So we're going to divide by minus 2 plus c. At this point, I just want to mention I much prefer you to write this as minus a third cos 3x minus 2 plus c. And this one here, you could write as minus a half e to the 1 minus 2x plus c. It's not wrong, I just think it's a little bit neater to write it like that. Going forward, cos of a third x minus 2. Cos now integrates to sine. So cos of something integrates to sine of 1 third x minus 2. Now, usually, we multiply by this derivative, the inner derivative. Multiply by a third. Now, we're going to divide by a third. And dividing by a third is the same as timesing by 3. So, I need to squeeze a 3 in at the beginning. So, that's 3 sine a third x minus 2. Of course, add plus c. Right. Last one. 3x minus 2 to the power of 8. What do we usually do in differentiation? In differentiation, we bring the power down, reduce the power, and then multiply it by the derivative. So we're going to do a similar approach, but we're doing integration. So instead of bringing the power down, what do I do in integration first? I raise the power up. So the bracket of 3x minus 2, we're going to increase the power to 9, divide by the new power, in differentiation, we're not finished there. We usually multiply by this derivative, which is 3. So what do we do now? We divide by that derivative. Divide by the 3. Now, because I've already divided by 9, if you want to then divide by 3, just squeeze the 3 on the bottom. But then multiply. You divide by 9. If you divide by 9 and then divide by 3, that's the same as dividing by 27. Okay? Which becomes 3x minus 2 to the power of 9 divided by 27, and then you have your plus c. So increase the power, divide by the new power, but then divide by the derivative where we would usually times by the derivative. Now, you may have noticed that the examples I gave you involved linear <coughs> functions inside sine, cos, e. So, for example, when we integrate e, to the 3 minus 2x, we reversed the chain rule for differentiation. So we said e to the something integrates to e to the something. And instead of multiplying by the inner derivative, we divide. The derivative there is minus 2, so we divide by minus 2, and we tidy it up by writing minus a half e to the 3 minus 2x plus c. But all the examples I gave you on the previous board had linear functions inside them, and that wasn't a coincidence. What's very important that you write down is that integration in this manner, i.e. the reverse chain rule, only works when the inner function is linear. Notice for the regular chain rule for differentiation, we were able to differentiate functions where the inner function was nonlinear. We know how to differentiate now sine 3x squared plus 2 e to the ln f, e to the ln cot x or something like that. That wasn't a problem. It was more involved, but it wasn't a problem. Yet for integration, it is a problem. We cannot apply this process to integrate something like e to the sec x. Okay? Will not work. And I want to investigate why that is. Let's go back to what I showed you not so long ago 
when we started this idea and let's explore why. We said that sine 2x differentiates to 2 cos 2x, which meant that 2 cos 2x must, by extension, integrate to sine 2x. Plus c, of course, but I'll leave that for now. And then we said, okay, well, I want to know how to integrate cos 2x. I don't want that 2 there. And we discussed that the 2 doesn't really get involved in integration. We, we discussed that. Okay, the integral of 2 times something is the same as 2 times that integral. So I can take that 2 out. So you can take the 2 out. And then you can divide both sides by 2. So that's how we know that cos 2x is this. And I'll put the plus c in. But you can take out numbers, coefficients, numerical coefficients out of an integral. You cannot take out terms that have x in them because they will attract the integration. You can take out 2 or 3 or 4 or a half. You cannot take out x or cos x or e to the x, something that has x in it. So you can only divide both sides by a constant. And the division by a constant, effectively, also that 2 comes from the derivative of the 2x. So if you're only allowed to divide both sides by a number, that means that the inside function has to differentiate to a number. Now what kind of function differentiates to a number? It's a linear function, 2x or 2x plus a half or 2x plus 5 or something like that. So, for example, let's look at differentiating something where the inner function is nonlinear. So, let's say, for example, sine 2x cubed. If we differentiate sine 2x cubed, that would be cos 2x cubed, multiplied by that derivative, which is 6x squared. So, it now follows that 6x squared times cos 2x cubed integrates to sine 2x cubed, plus c. But now we have a problem. I'm not allowed to take 6x squared all out the integral and divide both sides. I can take the 6 out, but I can't take the whole of 6x squared out, which would be that derivative. And because I can't take out the 6x squared, it means I cannot divide both sides by 6x squared in the way that I do here. In the way that I do here. Which means that when you are applying the reverse chain rule, you are only allowed to end up dividing by a constant. And that means that the inside function has to be linear. So therefore, If I want to apply the reverse chain rule, you cannot use it for something like this. We'll have to think about something else. That's because the inside function of E is cos. That's not linear. I couldn't do this either. That's because inside cos is ln. Now, that's not linear. However, if I do cos of 3 plus x, that's okay. Because inside cos is a linear function. You have to think, what's the outside function and what's the inner function? In the same way for differentiation, except for integration, if the inside function is nonlinear, you cannot apply this, you cannot divide by this derivative. And that derivative, because that derivative would be not a number. We just discussed you cannot divide by that. So, so what we can do is we can use the reverse chain rule for the following types of examples. E to the 3x minus 1. That's okay, dx. Inside the e is linear. Cos 5x minus 2. That's okay, because inside cos is linear. It has to be a linear function inside something you can integrate. Okay? It, has to be, it can't just be any old linear function. It has to be something that you know is the differential of something else. Okay, that's okay. Like similarly for sine. I can also do, like we saw, 3x minus 4 to the 7. A linear function to the power of 7, we can do that. Right? If that was 3x squared, no good. 
I can't increase the power and divide by the new power and then divide by that derivative if it was 3x squared because it would differentiate to something that is not a number. But as it stands, 3x minus 4 to the power 7, that's okay. We can even do sec squared of 5x minus 2 because sec squared, we know, integrates to tan and inside sec squared is linear. So it would be tan of 5x minus 2, and then divided by this derivative is 5. Just remember, if you attempt to divide by a derivative that is not a number, well, you shouldn't be doing that. Okay, then you've gone down the wrong path. Okay, so that's what we're saying. That's a really important point. So make sure you've got it down in your notes. Reverse chain rule does not work if the inside function is not linear. It's only allowable if it's linear. So a few more integrals we want to be using at this stage that follow on directly from differentials that we know. So we talked about sine and cos, but we know that tan differentiates to sec squared. Hopefully we remember that sec differentiates to sec x times tan x, cosec differentiates to minus cosec times cot, and cosec, I'm sorry, cot differentiates to minus cosec squared. Because cosec and cot differentiate to differentials with a minus in front. That means when we're trying to integrate them, we need to flip the minus to the other side. So in other words, you also need to be aware, if you add this to your table of integrals, that if you have sec squared of something, it will differentiate to tan, cosec x times cot x, will actually differentiate to minus cosec x, because cosec differentiated to minus cosec cot. So because we differentiated cosec cot without the minus, the minus will go to the other side. Similarly, cosec squared differentiates to minus cot x. Now sec x tan x is the exact differential without a minus of sec. And I'm going to explore with you what happens when we integrate 1 over x. Now you might tell me it's ln of x, the natural log of x. There's a slight little, uh, slight little tweak that we need to make to that, uh, which I'm going to explore in a minute. So I'm going to just write 1 over x here, and we're going to just leave that sort of open as it stands. So we have those different, so add those, and again, that's nothing too bad because you know each of these, the differentials, we just have to be careful where to place the minus, and that gets, that takes some getting used to, which is why I always say I wouldn't rely on the formula book that cosec differentiates to cosec x cot x. So you need to recognise that when you see cosec cot, ah, that's the differential of cosec, you need to know to expect that, so you need to know that cosec cot is a differential, okay, so you cannot be relying on the formula book. Uh, in that respect, you need to know that these things here are derivatives. Okay? Other expressions aren't, and we have to do something else with them. A uh, slight problem we encounter is that if you differentiate d by dx, if you differentiate ln of x, we know we get 1 over x. But let's start talking about domains, okay? the inputs, the x values. Let's look at the graphs, right? Ln x, of course, looks like this, going through 1. And we can see from the graph, and you should know from your work with exponentials and logarithms, that ln x can only take positive values. And that's because ln x uh, is log base e, and you cannot raise e to any number and get a negative result, which means that the inputs for ln can only be positive. So this ln x function itself is only defined for x is strictly bigger than 0. That's the domain of ln x. Now, 1 over x we know can exist for negative values. It can't exist when x is 0. There's an asymptote when x is 0. It's not, the graph of 1 over x is not defined when x is 0. But everywhere else is, is fine. So the domain here is x is anything, which we write like this. x can take any real number except for 0. And if you don't like this notation, well, maybe you want to write it like this. It could be 
negative x, a negative value, or positive values. So when we differentiate ln x to 1 over x, the reverse of integrating 1 over x straight to ln x is only true, strictly true, when x is positive. But what about negative x? So what I can say at this point for certain is that if you're integrating 1 over x dx equal to ln x, that statement is definitely true when x is positive. 100% true when x is positive. But we want to be able to integrate 1 over x for negative x because we know 1 over x exists for negative x. And you could, you could potentially, right, you could potentially find an area between 1 over x and the x-axis for negative x. But I can't do that because if I, if I integrate 1 over x to ln, I can't put a negative number into a ln. Do you see the problem? It exists for negative x, but ln of x doesn't. But it must be done. I can see there's an area there, right? I can, I can physically see there's an area there. So what do I do? So let's see. So to understand how to be able to integrate 1 over x for negative x when ln x is not defined for negative x can be done. And let me show you how. So let's differentiate ln x. Go back to differentiation. After all, differentiation and integration are connected. Okay? Why is ln x? And dy by dx is 1 over x. Now, consider ln of minus x. Ln of minus x. Just a little bit of chain rule to do here. Then dy by dx would be as thought of as follows. Ln of something is 1 over that something. So it's 1 over minus x, but I'll just stick the minus there. And we have to multiply by this derivative, which is minus 1. Now, minus 1 over x multiplied by minus 1 is, of course, 1 over x. So, dy by dx is 1 over x when y is ln of minus x. And dy by dx for just regular ln x is also 1 over x. But let's go back to this, this uh, ln minus x here. Some of you may be troubled by looking at ln of minus x. Now, ln we know can only take positive values. So ln of minus x can only possibly exist if x is negative. If x is positive, you're looking at a function that forces negative values into ln, which cannot happen, as we've discussed. So this bit here only possibly exists when x is negative. And this bit here only possibly exists if x is positive. I can't have the input of a ln to be negative. So it can't be negative here, and it can't be positive here. So x is positive here, and x is negative there. How do we combine these results together? We say as follows. Because 1 over x either integrates to ln x, or integrates to ln of minus x. I don't want to have sort of two options. I want to do that in one go. So we say as follows, the integral of 1 over x dx integrates either to ln x, so we'll say this as it stands, it integrates to ln x when x is positive, and it integrates to ln of minus x when x is negative. So we've got two cases, but as I said, we can squash this together. Let's think what's happening. If x is positive, okay, then the result ends up being ln of that x. But when x is negative, what happens to the inside of the ln? You end up minusing the x. So the input from here to here ends up being minused. When do we do that? When do we turn a negative into a positive or vice versa? with the modulus function, the modulus function. So what we can say that covers both cases is that the integral of 1 over x is simply equal to ln of the modulus of x plus c. So does that work? Let's just have a look. We said the integral of 1 over x is ln of x, x positive. Well, when x is positive, the modulus doesn't do anything anyway. 
So lul of x is the same as lul of modulus of x when x is positive. But if x is negative, look what happens. That negative x ends up being minused, and it turns into positive. When you're turning a negative number to a positive number, you are applying the modulus. So instead of writing minus x, we can just write mod x, because it doesn't affect this, and it, it's basically another way of doing that minus x. So in other words, when you integrate 1 over x, it's not just ln x now, it's ln of the modulus of x. So what you have to do is you have to remember when you're integrating 1 over x to always have a modulus on the x. It's only an issue really if you try to input negative x values, but for indefinite integrals you should really write ln of the modulus of x. So this is the scenario we are now in that all of these integrals we've now gone through, most of them being the reverse, direct reverse of the differentials. So if you're e to the x, it'll integrate to e, you have cos, sine, sec squared, all of these are derivatives. And we discussed that uh, 1 over x is integrates to ln of mod x to take care of both uh, domains of x. And of course you've got the integration from year 1. And we've also discussed the reverse chain rule, that if any of these functions here, if that x is replaced by a linear function, so if any of these guys over here have a linear function replacing the x, you can apply the reverse chain rule by integrating and then dividing by the numerical derivative you will get by differentiating the inner function, which we said has to be linear, so you'll get a number. So if you can identify that you've got one of these functions with up to a maximum of a linear function that's replacing the x, then you can apply these rules and then make sure that you divide by the derivative accordingly. Of course, if it's just x, literally if it's functions that look exactly like this, then the answer is that. So, make sure you've got this table in your notes, and I want you now to have a go at the next few questions that will appear on this board in a moment. So here we go, I've got five examples here, I'd like you to have a go, they all involve the reverse chain rule. So look at that table, try and identify which function you are integrating, and then worry about the inner function. Be particularly careful with 4 and 5, they're very similar, with a crucial difference. So please jot these down, including the integrals, including the dx, have a go, then pause the video and wait for me to go through them and uh, tick them off as you get them right, or make corrections if you slipped up. Okay, so, integrated cos. Hopefully we recognise from the table that cos integrates to sine. So cos of half x will integrate to sine of half x, because cos integrates to sine, but the inside function of cos is half x, the derivative of that is a half, so we have to divide by a half. Divided by the half is the same as times e by 2. And you get plus c. Of course, you could differentiate that and verify that it goes back. That's the answer. 2 sine half x plus c. The second one is e to the something. e to the something integrates to itself. But inside the e is 3 minus x. When you differentiate that, that's minus 1. And if you divide by minus 1, it's the same as just having a minus on the outside there. Be careful not just to integrate that to this and that without worrying about dividing by the derivative of the inside function. Right, this one here. So we've got something to the power of 5. Remember, something to the power of a numerical number is the basic integration from year one. You increase the power, so I'm going to have 8 minus 3x to the power of 6 divided by the new power, but we don't stop there. We have to look at the inside function. The derivative there is minus 3, so you have to divide by minus 3. We've already divided by 6. So if you're dividing again by minus 3, you can just squeeze a minus 3 there giving me minus 18. Remember, if you have a minus on the denominator, just bring that minus up. It's just neater. So it's minus 1 over 18, 8 minus 3x to the power of 6. I'll put the final answer here. So you've got minus 1 over 18. That's that bit there. 8 minus 3x 
So the power of 6, don't forget, plus C. Okay, 1 over 4x plus 1, I have to be careful. 1 over something is, corresponds to the integral in the table, 1 over x. 1 over, so remember x now has been replaced by this linear function. Now we said 1 over x is ln mod x plus c. So 1 over 4x plus 1, 1 over something, must be ln mod, look at the mod, of 4x plus 1. Once again, the linear function that has replaced the x over there, the derivative is 4, and it's integration. I have to divide by 4. So really, if you're dividing this by 4, it's 1 quarter, 1 quarter, ln mod 4x plus 1, plus c. Now, number 5 is not a ln job. Okay? It's not a case where the answer would involve a natural logarithm. And that's because 1 over something, it has to be linear, completely linear on the bottom, for it to be a ln. So 1 over 4x plus 1, 1 over 2 minus 3x, 1 over x, 1 over 3x, 1 over 5x, all those kind of things is, will be a ln. Just have to, it's just a case of dividing by the derivative of that linear function. Now 1 over square root of a linear function is not a linear function. Okay, if you square, if you take a linear function and square root it, if you take a linear function and cube it, it's no longer linear. So this one here, it's a bit of a trick. It, it, it makes you think it's ln. Okay, it's not ln root 4x plus 1 divided by 4. Because that's not linear. 4x plus 1 by itself is linear. The square root makes it non-linear. So instead, for this one over here, we have to write it as 4x plus 1 to the power of minus a half dx, and treat it exactly the same way like this. This one actually is much more like this than it is that. Now, 4x plus 1 in brackets to the power of minus a half, we apply exactly the same way. Increase the power from minus a half to a half, divide by the new power. Now, when you're divided by a half, you could write divided by half, that's the same as 2, times it by 2. So if you divide by the new power half, you've got 2 there. And now I have to remember to divide by the differential of the linear function, which is dividing by 4. Now I've run out of space, but that 2 over 4 would simplify to a half. So the final answer, I'm going to write it up here, the final answer for this one is 1 half times 4x plus 1 to the power of a half plus c. You could then write 4x plus 1 all, the, all to the power of a half as the square root of 4x plus 1. Okay, so three more questions. Um, three more questions for you to do. Um, be careful with them. Each of them should only take two lines because you're just identifying which derivative, which antiderivative rather, to apply. But just be careful with the inside functions. So have a go with these uh, three questions. Pause the video, press play when you're ready, and I'll take you through them. Okay, so you need to recognize that sec and tan of the same input would work if it was different input. So sec of something times tan of the same something is the derivative of sec. So that integrates to sec. So we've got sec of a third x. But the inside function, which is the same function in the second and the same function in the tan, is a third x. When you differentiate that, you get a third. But we're not times it, we're not differentiating. We're integrating. So you don't times by the third, you divide by a third. Divided by a third is the same as times by three, so we've got a three there. Plus c, that's the answer to that one. Three sec, one third x plus c. Right, eight sec squared. So first of all, the eight in the front will just sit there. We'll just put an eight in the coefficients. I'm not going to worry too much about that. Remember I said you could even take the eight out and bring it back later, but I'm just going to let it sit there. When you integrate sec squared, 
And if we recognise sec squared is the differential of tan. So sec squared would integrate to tan. I'll not forget the 8 is there as well. So this would be 8 tan, just tan, of a half x. But inside the function of sec squared is a half x, which is linear. That differentiates to a half. And we'll be dividing by a half, which is the same as times in by 2. There's already 8 there, so I'm going to have to times that by 2. And lo and behold, that finally becomes 16 tan a half x plus c. And again, you can differentiate that, and you can quickly see that that bring up the half and turn into an 8, differentiate tan at sec squared, and it's, it's going to work. It's going to end up being 8 sec squared half x. Once again, number three, a word of warning, do not think, or attempt to think even, that this is going to end up being a lun. It's only a lun if there's a linear function and a strict linear function on the bottom. It isn't. There's a linear function here, but it's being squared. Okay, so only when there's a linear function on the, a pure linear function on the denominator of a quotient can we begin to go down the road of it turning into a lun. So if that wasn't there, it would be 4 ln of this, and then divide by the minus 1. But it's not. You have to turn this so it looks like 4 multiplied by 3 minus x and minus 2 dx. There's no good having it as a function unless... Sorry, there's no good having it as a fraction unless... On the denominator is a pure linear function. No square roots, no cube roots, no, 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 no powers at all. So we have to convert it out. It's only written like that because to confuse you, to make you think, to go down the path of a loop. So here we have 4 times something to the power of minus 2. So it's standard. Right, so we do 4, keep that sitting there. 3 minus x to the power of minus 1, divided by minus 1. But the 4, when divided by minus 1, will turn into minus 4. So I'll just stick a minus there. Plus C. And there are your that's your answer there. Minus 4 times 3 minus x in brackets to the power of minus 1 plus C.